to call the meeting to order and thank everyone for their attendance. It's always a pleasure to have our wonderful school board members with the wonderful city council together. And this is our annual uh, event where we get the five-year forecast and we look forward to uh, getting it going. And uh, is Greg going to start this off, Dave? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, we have Greg Vindors, who is the economist for our uh, PDC here in Hampton Roads. And uh, as for those members of the council that attend those meetings, uh, saw that uh, presentation. And you're going to get a little bit more elaborate one today. And I hope you find this informative and is a good lead-in for uh, both our uh, uh, David Bradley and uh, Farrell, or Farrell Hansiker to uh, give his presentations. Greg, we're glad to have you here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, Mr. Hansen asked that I bring these benchmarking studies around, so uh, everybody should have one of these reports uh, in front of you. Uh, feel free to use it as a stocking stuffer. They're phenomenal. Um, with no further ado, I'm going to get right into this. Uh, Mr. Hansen asked that I present on the um, Hampton Roads economy and just kind of give you a basic uh, briefing on it. And so I'll jump right into that. Uh, one of the things we do, it's in this report, we compare the Hampton Roads region to other metropolitan areas between one and three million, there's 35 of them, and we just kind of uh, measure up on some certain uh, indicators you can see here. Uh, when we compare to those other metropolitan areas, uh, we're number one in terms of the percentage of the population that are veterans. Um, we're number three, and I'll touch back on this later, uh, we're number three in terms of the number of people who leave their jurisdiction of residence to go to work. Uh, we're number five when we look at the percentage of renters spending greater than 30% of their income on housing. That is not a good number. Uh, we're right in the middle when it comes to per capita income. Uh, also in the middle when we're looking at percent who have bachelor's degrees. Uh, we're relatively young, uh, 29th out of 35. And lastly here, uh, Gini coefficient is a measure of income inequality. Um, and you want to be near the bottom there. So 33 out of 35 is a, is a fantastic place to be. And I'll touch a little bit more on that later as well. So how have we been doing? Uh, this is the gross product, inflation-adjusted gross product for the region going about all the way back to 2001. And as you can see, uh, things aren't necessarily great. They were great. We grew at 20.4% between 2002 and 2007. Over the past nine years, we've seen a 2.7% decrease. Uh, this is not great. Uh, lackluster growth is especially evident when we're looking at employment. Here we have uh, annualized percent change in total employment, once again comparing Hampton Roads to those other metropolitan areas between one and three million. And you can see uh, over the past three years when we look at the change in employment, uh, we're sixth last, which is not good. But it's better than last year when we were fourth last and two years ago when we were dead last. So we're moving in the right direction. Um, but still not very good for Hampton Roads. Of course, uh, the, this is different across industries, and I'll touch it a little bit more on that. Uh, but if we look at what has happened since the Great Recession, the Great Recession was, uh, played a significant role in Hampton Roads. And that red bar there is essentially um, where we started. So this black line shows the U.S. national civilian non-farm employment uh, starting when the recession hit the U.S. And so uh, month zero is when it hit, and it took uh, 76 months to get back to the um, pre-recession level of employment for the U.S. And you can see, you can see this, little, this little bump here is actually uh, the census, when they did the census, so you saw a bunch of hiring there real quick. Uh, but essentially a sustained trend toward recovery. If you look at Virginia, uh, Virginia didn't have as much of a consistent growth trend, but it was still nonetheless a growth trend that went up. And in 2014, both the nation and the Commonwealth recovered all the jobs that they had lost during the recession. And now you have the green line, which is Hampton Roads, and things do not look uh, near as rosy. In fact, we still have not recovered the jobs. We're uh, just under 17,000 non-farm civilian jobs um, 
below our pre-recession high. Uh, if I were to take out that civilian part and I would include the military personnel that we've lost, uh, we are down roughly 37,000 jobs uh, from where we were in 2007 when the recession hit Hampton Roads. Uh, needless to say, this does not paint a rosy picture for Hampton Roads. If we look at where those uh, civilian jobs have been lost over the past 10 years, it's not static across industry. Uh, you can see that the federal government, uh, surprisingly, is near the top there, scientific and technical as well, and then on top, um, you have healthcare. And healthcare has grown gangbusters across the nation, uh, across the Commonwealth, and we've seen a lot of growth in that sector here as well. On the bottom end, you can see where we've lost a lot of construction jobs, retail trade, and local government jobs in Hampton Roads as well, and that's um, hurting the recovery, especially those construction and retail trade jobs that usually bump up. Uh, we expect those to kind of pull us out of uh, recessions, and they're still way down. If you look at the last year-over-year -year data, th this is where things start getting a little bit interesting. Because when we look at this data here, this is called payroll employment data, and it's typically the number one source that most of the newspapers, economists, everybody look to when you get the Bureau of Labor Statistic releases the employment numbers at a Friday at the end of the month, and you can tell that the U.S. went up 200,000 or 150,000. They're talking about the payroll employment jobs. And we rely on these jobs. We rely on these numbers. They tend to be the best indicator we have in Hampton Roads of what the economy looks like. And then we come across this chart, and it shows us what the one year and change in employment was in Hampton Roads. And on the bottom, you see uh, leisure and hospitality, our tourism industry, and retail trade. And they're declining substantially year over year. And uh, at the Planning District Commission, you know, we looked at these numbers and we said, well, uh, this doesn't measure up. Because if you talk to, you know, especially in Virginia Beach, but Williamsburg, if you talk to people who are in the hospitality industry, they're not seeing this. And if you look at the retail, uh, the retail expenditures and the sales tax coming in, we're not seeing quite a cut. So there are different statistics that we can look at. Um, for one is the unemployment rate. Most economists will tell you that the unemployment rate in and of itself is useless. Uh, but what is important is the trend. So if we look at the trend here, you see the U.S. is in black, uh, Hampton Roads in green, and Virginia is orange again. You can see that the trends have all been similar. Uh, we, we saw unemployment rates go up during the recession. They've all come down. Um, this, is, this paints a, a, a very different picture from what we're seeing in the payroll employment numbers. It shows that Hampton Roads, when we're looking at who's saying they're employed and who's not employed, we're doing okay. Uh, oddly enough, the components of the unemployment rate are the number, you have the labor force, the number of people employed, and the number of people who say they're unemployed. If we look at just the number of people who say they're employed, well, we have as many people employed now, we have 10,000 more people employed now than we did at the beginning of the recession. And we recovered all those employed people in 2014, the same time as the nation and the Commonwealth. So this is painting a little bit of a different picture um, than the, the standard payroll employment data that you see splashed on the front page of the newspaper. Uh, this is kind of important. To touch on it a little differently here, you can see over the past two years, uh, the red line is the number of employed civilians, people who say they're employed, and the blue line is payroll employment. So those are um, the jobs that are out there. We're seeing a decrease in the number of jobs and an increase in the number of people saying that they're employed. Um, there's a few reasons that this can happen. For example, if you are laid off from a, a company and you start your own business, you will drop from the payroll employment numbers and you'll be part of the workforce nonetheless, but that wouldn't account for so much of a change. Uh, so we have a little bit of a discrepancy between the payroll employment and the unemployment rate numbers, so we'll look to a little bit of some of the other data we look at. One of those is initial unemployment claims. This is a leading economic indicator. Um, when you see this pop up, it means we're in trouble, typically. Uh, those gray bars there are the recessions, and you can see that when initial unemployment claims, people who suddenly have lost their job um, file for unemployment, that typically spikes. And uh, we are on par with our lowest rate of initial unemployment claims in the region ever. Uh, so this is not telling us that drastic days are ahead 
This is telling us that we're relatively stable, and this coincides with the unemployment numbers. Um, taking a little bit of a different track here, um, one of the most important things when we're looking at um, quality of life and, and uh, how well off people are is income. Here you have relative per capita income. The black line is the national level. So anytime we're above, the, these gray bars are above the black line, we surpass the national level and we're below the black line. Uh, we're below the national level. And you can see at the end there, uh, we had five, we're five years in a row of, of decline from the national level. Um, the last year we bumped up again, we changed course. But essentially this is, this is important when we're looking at overall levels of wealth. And when we're above that black line, you can see that Hampton Roads relative to the nation is, is doing well. The gray bar is how Hampton Roads is doing relative to Virginia. And you can see that uh, we're below 90% of the Commonwealth when it comes to relative per capita income. So the total income divided by all the people, uh, we're at 88% of what the Commonwealth is. And essentially, you know, uh, we want to be right at least at 100%. That's a healthy place to be. Uh, we're not quite there. But there's multiple ways of looking at income. Here's another one. This is the median family income. And, and this, is, this is much more positive. Now, if I had to choose, do I want to have a higher per capita income or a higher median income, I definitely would take the median income. The median income is the better number for quality of life. And this shows that Hampton Roads is doing relatively well when it comes to median income. And this comes back to that Gini coefficient I talked about earlier. You can have a huge disparity between the haves and the have-nots. Bring Bill Gates into Virginia Beach, and your per capita income goes through the roof. You know, it's a good thing, but it's not as good of a thing as if you lift all incomes. And lifting all incomes will lift the median income. And, and that's why this is a really strong quality of life indicator, and it's really good for Hampton Roads. You can, um, one of the things that contributes to that, of course, is earnings per worker. And I'll just touch on this briefly, but you can see there was a pretty big disparity between Hampton Roads and the U.S. in terms of earnings per worker. You can see through the 90s there, we had a lot of catching up to do. Uh, earnings per worker, as you probably read or heard about, has stayed relatively flat. The national level, it has stayed flat at the regional level as well, but we are right at where the nation is. One of the biggest components, of course, um, of the economy in Hampton Roads is the defense federal expenditures. And here you have uh, real, defen real defense lay outlays uh, annualized. Um, and you can see, when we look from peak to trough, uh, from the Vietnam War, we saw a 30% decline in outlays. In the 80s Cold War buildup, we saw 47%. The war and terror uh, were down 27%. The interesting thing that is that if we do a, a trend line going back to the 60s here, uh, population increases at a growth rate of about 1.05%. Uh, defense outlays, if we just put a trend line through there, we're at 1.15%. So although this is highly cyclical and fluctuates significantly, long-term averages suggest that it just slightly outpaces um, population. We look in Hampton Roads now, what this black line is, it's military personnel as a share of Hampton Roads total employment. Um, I wasn't back here in 1969, but back then military personnel accounted for over 25% of the region's total employment. That's just the military personnel, not the civilian side, was over 25% of um, Hampton Roads total. Uh, we've seen significant decline since then, since 1990. We've dropped almost 60,000. The past 10 years has been 23,000. But one of the things that we hear so much about is how the Hampton Roads needs to diversify the economy. We have to remember, when you start looking way back, the foundation of what the regional economy was built on was defense. So that's what brought a lot of people into the place and built the economy in the first place. And we certainly have declined since then. So over time, uh, our economy has been naturally diversifying. One of the things that we did see um, 
We saw significant cuts here in military personnel, 22, 23,000 in the past 10 years. A lot of that was offset by defense contracts in Hampton Roads. So when we saw the cuts to military personnel, we saw the Department of Defense was spending out a whole lot of money to the private sector through military contracts. This is fantastic, shipbuilding, ship repair, all that. And it hit us right when we needed the money. We saw increase in housing expenditures and so on and so forth. But in the last five, six years, we saw cuts to defense contracting. We saw sequester put in place. And suddenly, what was, what was working to offset the cuts in military personnel exacerbated military personnel. So it was kind of a double hit to Hampton Roads. Not only are we pulling your employment, but we're also pulling the private side of where we're putting the money in. And that's really what we've been fighting up, fighting against the stream in the last couple of years. So then what becomes really important then is, well, what's happening at the federal level? Um, so we look at this, and we look at it frequently to try to determine, uh, well, what can we expect? Here you have the president's budget of 2012, uh, which is no more than you know what the pres president would like to, uh, to spend. And then we start analyzing all these different things that we get in front of us, the Budget Control Act of 2011, American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012, Bipartisan Budget Act of 2013, Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015. And essentially, these are all things at the federal level that suggest how much we're going to spend on defense, what we can expect, what economists and planners and budget directors can all look at for their expectations. And then you have the reality of what they actually spend, which is the orange line, which is disconnected from most everything. Um, but that orange line is vitally important to Hampton Roads because it gives us a sense of what we can expect to come in at the federal level. I'll just take a talk about the ports real quick. Um, you see a lot of different uh, stats on ports and when you look at the Port of Hampton Roads, it's really important, or the Port of Virginia rather as it's called. It's important that, uh, to know that you, you need to look at all different data sources to really understand uh, what's going on. Um, Hampton Roads has the second largest port on the East Coast when you look at total weight, the third largest uh, just behind Savannah and ahead of Charleston when you're looking at the total value. Um, the number of departures is going down, but the uh, amount of cargo is going up. We're getting these much bigger ships coming in. Um, so the, here what you see is just the, the general cargo in Hampton Roads. Uh, one of the things that we look at is how much this is tied to global trade. So if you put global trade and you put the trend line for global trade on there, the general cargo going through the ports is very closely tied to um, global trade. The amount of cargo going through the ports of Virginia, however, is not tied to the uh, impact, the economic impact on Hampton Roads. So if there's a huge increase or decrease in trade at the port, that's not going to be reflected in the economic impact that the port has on Hampton Roads. A lot of the impacts that the port has on Hampton Roads are fixed. They'll decrease or increase slowly over time, but the whole level of trade is more tied to just trucking and pass-through. That's important to remember because you don't want people to conflate those two ideas. Uh, this is Le uh, Hampton Roads Leisure and Hospitality Employment. Um, one of the things you can look at here is um, annualized growth rate since 1990 has been 1.62%. Over the last five years, it's been 1.67%. A lot of people, when they think of the Hampton Roads economy, they think of the three legs. They think of defense, they think of the ports, and they think of tourism. All three are vitally important. And all three have different trends moving forward. Uh, it's always important to remember um, that the leisure and hospitality, the tourism industry in Hampton Roads is a relatively mature industry. It's, it's steadfastly important, but it's relatively mature. So we don't expect to see huge gains in the future. We don't expect to see huge declines. We expect kind of this continuous slow growth. I think Virginia Beach is one of the localities that has done especially well in recent years, especially broadening out to the shoulder seasons and bringing more people in. Um, but again, the, the, the amount that you can expect this to grow is somewhat limited with what we have in the region. I wanted to talk about retail. A lot of, there's been a lot of press recently on retail and what's happening at the national level, uh, what's happening locally. But essentially, we're seeing a lot of retail employment drop off both nationally, uh, regionally it's been more so. Uh, since 1990, you've seen a significant drop 
uh, much more at the regional level than you have at the national level. Um, people are becoming more efficient. Retailers are more efficient, so they need fewer employees to sell the same amount of goods. And then, of course, uh, there's the whole online sector as well. So we're seeing significant cuts to retail employment. A lot of malls are having issues because of online uh, sales. Um, but there's a lot of questions in the air where this is going to go moving forward. And I certainly can't be the one to answer this, but we can look at the employment numbers there. One of the things that I can say is there's suddenly become kind of a disconnect between the amount of income people have and what they're spending on retail. Now, when you think retail, that's when you go to the store and you buy, it can be anything from cars to bread. Um, but a lot of people are spending more, a, share, a greater share of their income on services than retail. And if you look at the way that Virginia taxes, we don't tax services, we just tax retail. Um, that would suggest that your revenue potential here is rather limited if you have cut a huge section of what people are actually making purchases on out of your retail expenditure quotient. A lot of other states have tried to fix it. It's probably something Virginia needs to look at and soon. Um, but this retail uh, component uh, is a little bit uh, limited in that growth. That said, if we look at where our, this is a three month moving, uh, moving average of local option retail. This is actual money coming back to Hampton Roads based on what people spent. Uh, the trend is in the right direction. Very different from what I showed you with retail employment in the region. This suggests that retail employment uh, is, is not a good indicator of what revenues we're getting. Our revenues are coming in strong. I'll quickly touch on housing here. Um, you can see that there was a huge bump in housing. These are building permits in Hampton Roads. Uh, the builders were much, were, they were ahead of the rest of us, certainly. They saw uh, the boom. They helped with the boom, and they stopped building before the crash. They stopped in 2005. Uh, so you can see kind of what happened in Hampton Roads housing market. Uh, this is the number of closings in Hampton Roads, and you can see how we had a huge increase in the number of closings. We saw the drop, and since then we've picked back up to what appears to be a, a pretty steady, stable, and healthy uh, market, at least in terms of sales. Um, Hampton Roads, here you have the Hampton Roads is a green line, Virginia orange, and in the U.S. in black once again. Uh, this is a home price index going back to all the way to 2000. So this compares houses, the same house over time. It's just tracking the same houses over time in these markets. And you can see where we were in 2007. Hampton Road said something a little bit different. Um, we saw a much bigger boom than both the uh, nation and the Commonwealth because uh, housing prices were undervalued here for one. We had a huge increase in military incomes, was the second thing, and there was a big increase in housing allowances for federal employees, uh, defense employees as well. And surprisingly, uh, federal employees took that housing increase and they shoved it into housing. And when they did that, uh, we had three things that impacted the regional housing market that the Commonwealth and the nation did not have. So you add that to these ninja loans where you no income, no job, anybody can get a loan. Uh, credit was very easy to access. So all that helped run up housing prices. Um, but then when the, the contraction came, of course, Hampton Roads got hit a little bit harder. Um, Still, the, the, the big point here is when you looked at 2012, 2013, 2014, certainly the city assessor is happy to see that that green line for the region is moving sideways. Now, of course, housing markets are local. They're the most local markets there are. But there's a regional component to this. So when we see these, the trend pushing up, that, that the biggest thing is that we're no longer on the bottom. We've seen the bottom. We've come off it. So that makes planning for the future much easier. Uh, quick touch on per capita local revenues. You can see here, um, obviously, the real property tax, the orange bar is the biggest component of that. That was cut significantly during the recession. Uh, we're slowly making our way back. Um, we're currently, uh, we peaked in 2008, and right now we're back to 2005, 2006 levels. Per capita expenditures by category. Um, this it's a little bit tougher to see, but uh, essentially Hampton Roads and Virginia, uh, the, the Commonwealth, spend essentially the same per capita expenditure. So the, the money that local governments spend on each of their citizens is relatively the same overall. 
but it differs by category. And here what I just want you to see is how sizable a share of local expenditures go to education. It's far and away the highest expenditure for localities, followed by public safety, health and welfare, public works. Uh, this takes that same data and compares Hampton Roads in general to the Commonwealth. So where do we spend more and where do we spend less per capita? And if we look at it that way, we spend a lot more on public works per capita. Uh, we spend a lot more on parks and recre recreation, judicial administration, a little bit more on uh, public safety. The gray bar is overall. So ov overall, we're spending the same per capita dollars on, um, on our citizens as the rest of the Commonwealth. And then we fall short in areas of education and health and wel welfare. So, in those two areas, that's where we're spending less than uh, the Commonwealth as a whole. We talk, look a little bit more at per pupil school spending. Uh, you can see for the, the region, Hampton Roads, we have spent consistently less uh, than the Commonwealth. Um, you saw that we peaked here in 2009. Of course, this is inflation adjusted, so we peaked in 2009. Uh, we've come down significantly since, and so we bumped up from 2014 to 2015, the most recent data that we have. But Hampton Roads, again, consistently below. And then when we look at graduation rates, uh, Hampton Roads has been consistently below the Commonwealth in terms of graduation rates. Uh, once they changed how they actually calculated the graduation rates, uh, you can see the change there in 2008. Uh, they made a change that really showed, you know, for military transient community, it, it fixed a lot of the reporting problems. But still, Hampton Roads has underperformed the Commonwealth when it comes to graduation rates. Um, we've seen a consistent increase in graduation rates all the way up to 2016. In 2017, we saw our first drop after eight years of continuous growth. Uh, moving on to a couple other things I had mentioned, median household income was really important. I mentioned that the Gini coefficient was really important, Gini coefficient, the measure of income dispersity, median household income, real big quality of life measures. Hampton Roads does one thing really well. We have a really solid quality of life, and it's reflected not only in the Gini coefficient, the income numbers, but also in areas such as violent crime, where we uh, compare favorably uh, the poverty rate, where we compare favorably against the nation in other metropolitan areas. Uh, and even our air is getting better. Uh, water quality is good. And, and, you know, a lot of people will just look over these as, as less significant than the income numbers and the GDP numbers. I assure you this is, this is very, very important when people are looking at a place to stay and the one they want to remain in a place. Um, quality of life indicators uh, are of utmost importance. Real quick on, uh, I know David's going to talk a lot more about um, uh, population and demographic trends, but just Hampton Roads has had one year of population decline. That was from 78 to 79. That was following the Vietnam War. Um, but th this is probably one of the most boring charts I can show you. Um, we're at just over 1.7 million. But boring is not necessarily bad. Boring can be good. Um, and when you have this continuous growth rate, it allows you to plan continuously. And, and we can see that Hampton Roads although steady, um, has just performed at, a, at a, a pace that allows us to plan for the future. If we look at Hampton Roads population histogram, um, this shows where our population is broken down into five-year cohorts here. And uh, you can break it down by the greatest generation there. You see at the top of the silent generation, the boomers, generation X, millennials, and then the next generation. Um, Usually, this looks like a, t a triangle. You know, it's, it's the pyramid. And Hampton Roads, if I compare this to the nation, it's much more of a pyramid shape. Hampton Roads, we don't have that same shape. And certainly when we're looking at the next generation, especially uh, areas throughout Hampton Roads are no noticing that they're not having the school-aged children coming into the schools as they once had. And we're seeing uh, a significant change there. So that really is important looking to future years, and of course, when you look at the 2024, 25 to 29, a lot of the military people coming into the area expand those cohorts. Um, this goes back to the national level. Uh, this is kind of a look ahead. So what, what are the expectations going out? Uh, gross domestic product 
Uh, you can see that the consensus forecast here is that uh, black line is a long-term average. We're not expecting robust growth. We're not expecting a contraction. We're just kind of expecting more of the same that we've seen over the past four, five, six years, actually going all the way back to 2009. So expectations for the future uh, tend to be modest. They're not high. One of the things that you'll see in the paper quite frequently now is um, when are we going to get our next recession? Since World War II, the average time between recessions has been 58 months. Uh, we're now at 101. Um, so if you keep spinning that ball on the roulette wheel and you keep hitting black, somebody says, well, eventually it's going to hit red. Fortunately, there's no indicators right now suggesting that we're moving in or nearing a recession at any point. So hopefully 101 turns into 102, 103, and, and so on. And certainly that's the expectation. So this was all about Hampton Roads. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time to listen to it. So why do you want to hear about Hampton Roads? Uh, I told you that Hampton Roads came in third in terms of the people who leave their jurisdiction of residence to go to work. Um, my boss in the back there likes to call this uh, the spaghetti grant. Um, but essentially, this is commuting patterns in Hampton Roads. And, and this, is what we're, this is what we look like. This is what people do. This is where people go. Um, so what happens in one community impacts the other. I was asked to do a study with GIFCOM closed. Joint Forces Command in Suffolk. Suffolk asked us to do a study. The Planning District Commission said, this really sucks for Suffolk. Uh, can you tell us what the impact does? And so we took a look at the numbers, and I can tell you who it sucked for most, Virginia Beach. When Joint Forces Command shuttered in Suffolk, the number one hit community was Virginia Beach. Uh, that's because all the people working there, a majority of them, came from Virginia Beach. Second highest, Norfolk. Third highest, Chesapeake. Fourth highest, Suffolk. So what impacts one community certainly impacts the other. Uh, if you want to look more at Virginia Beach's commuting patterns, 40% of the employed people living in Virginia Beach work in another community. That means 40% of the, your residents who have a job leave Virginia Beach to go work in that job. And 30% of your employment force that is working here comes in from outside the community. Uh, so that's just important to keep in mind uh, when something happens in the Hampton Roads economy, it certainly affects the uh, Virginia Beach economy. Um, some conclusions here. We are inextricably linked to the federal sector. Um, people like to point to this as, as one of the, um, the difficulties of being in Hampton Roads. If I showed you that chart that over 25% of our workforce in 1969 was military personnel. Um, truly, when I look at the Department of Defense, we benefit from it greatly. We are tied to them. And you know, not quite to the same degree Las Vegas is tied to gambling. But every, every metropolitan area has kind of built themselves around a competitive advantage. And one of our competitive advantages, comparative advantages, has been traditionally defense. And we're going to be tied to them for years to come. So this is one of those things I want people to understand that we need to embrace this. This is really important to us. We want to grow this as much as we can. Uh, as much as we want to diversify, we will be linked to federal expenditures. Washington will have huge influence on us, and we need to recognize it, appreciate it, and learn to love it because it's really important. Uh, the region continues to struggle in the, great, in, in the wake of the Great Recession. Uh, those payroll employment numbers, they're one of the, the few statistics that is showing um, that we have not turned the corner, that we are still in the doldrums um, from the Great Recession. But there are a host of other indicators, the retail numbers, or the uh, housing numbers. There's a lot of other indicators to suggest that we have made great strides forward. We swam against the stream, uh, and we're doing well. Uh, the third point is probably the strongest point. You know, as an economist, obviously I'm looking at a lot of these employment, income, gross product numbers. The number one area of importance when you're looking at what it means to have a quality, uh, to have a growth in the region is quality of life. All the other indicators become insignificant compared to quality of life. If you're growing your quality of life, you don't need to be growing one other statistic. You could be losing population, you could be losing income, you can be losing a lot of things, but quality of life, if you can grow quality of life, that's the most important. Now, of course, a lot of those other statistics are tied to quality of life, 
But you know, when we're looking at violent crime, when we're looking at uh, the quality of the air, when we're looking at things like having beaches that you can go to, uh, it's hugely important. And finally, obviously, the investments that we're making today are going to paint the picture for, for our future. So that's really important moving forward. And with that, I'll turn it over to David. Glad to have you, David. Thank you. Mayor, I just want to thank Greg. When I had recommended to uh, Dave, the city manager, you know, that this would be very valuable because I always thought this was a missing part of this. So uh, I'd said, you know, I didn't stay in a Holiday Inn last night, so I'm not an economist. So uh, I hope that was useful. I always learn something from Greg when he's talking. We've, we've heard about the national economy, state and federal and, and regional. I thought I'd drill down a little bit into Virginia Beach and some of our demographics. So we kind of went back to 1980. This is a table that we show in our executive summary. I just thought this was interesting. You can see our heavy growth rate in the 80s, and you would have seen this in the 70s as well. I got here in 1988 in the budget office, and I can tell you at that time we were playing catch up. Uh, we were behind on roadways, schools, rec centers, and that was kind of our focus through referendums. And you kind of look to where we are today, I think you can see it in the discussions of the budget last year. Now we're kind of focusing on maintaining our infrastructure. You saw that with the stormwater discussion, city hall replacement, we're a maturing city. Uh, the other interesting thing to me, I think Greg said that we're relatively young as a region, if you look at our population from 1980 to 2016, you can see that the under 18 population was around 31% in 1980, and now it's almost uh, 20, it's gone down to 23%, whereas in 1980, 65 and older was 4.5%, about 13% today. So both of those have roughly switched. Our median age has gone from 27 in 1980 to roughly 36 today. And I just find this kind of fascinating when you look at this dependency ratio, you see this discussed at the federal level. This is the ratio of, of economically inactive people to e economically active. The idea being someone under 18 is not working or someone 65 or older is not working and the rest of the population is supporting them. Well, you can see that the, the total has not changed really but the ratio of under 18 has gone down while the ratio of 65 has gone up. And to me, this has impacts on the budget. Um, you can see in declining enrollment over the last two decades in the school system, that's probably a reflection of this. Also, you can see it, you know, as you know, they say a lot of the older people want to volunteer. That might be a very positive thing for us um, as our population ages. Rec center programs and, of course, health care needs will be a big part of this. We're a much more educated city from, as, as a citizen since 1980. 80% 80 of the people had a high school diploma in 1980. 93% today, this is the population 25 or older. The uh, proportion of uh, people with a bachelor's degree has gone from 22% to 35%. I thought this was fascinating. One out of eight people in our city have a graduate degree who's 25 years or older. So, uh, you know, I think this is important for us from an economic development standpoint. I think we have a lot to offer. But there is national data that says that there's an imbalance of, of uh, the people with education and the jobs that are needed. 47% of the people in America 25 or older have associate's degree, yet there's only 27% of the jobs that uh, need a, a degree. So this is the underemployment you hear a lot of young people talk about. My, a uh, 26-year-old daughter just moved to Nashville because she didn't feel like she was getting the employment opportunities that she wanted here. So, and I got a, another one getting ready to graduate in December from Old Dominion. So, we'll, hopefully that will work well for her. And my five-year forecast personally is starting to look a lot better. I'm not having to pay that. Um, cost burden housing. This is a measure of looking at, it, they say if you pay more than 30%, of your uh, expenses to your mortgage that it actually is harmful because you, you don't really have the money to maintain your house. This has stayed pretty steady since 1980. You can see that kind of peak in 2010. We were kind of in the depth of the recession. Uh, this is interesting to me. There's a lot more people that are mortgage free than there were in 1980. Probably a result of the aging population and people have paid their 30-year mortgage off. This has implications for things like the elderly tax relief pr program. Income, 
I think uh, Greg was talking about median uh, family income. I'm doing median household here. Uh, it's obviously increased since 1980. And uh, 2017, we're at $71,000. The per capita, which includes benefits, is 52. If you look at it in the 2010 constant dollars, they've grown, but not quite as much. Uh, during the recession, these were kind of going back and forth, up and down. <laughs> Poverty rates, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look from 1980, we're doing good. It's, it's gone down in, in these three categories. But since about 2000, those first two, two data points are 1980, 1990, then we went to, to 2000. It's been slowly creeping up uh, for children, individual, and elderly. I think you're seeing that in you know, a program in the schools, students that are qualifying for free and reduced lunch. Just wanted, before I get into the actual forecast, as a city, we do well when we compare ourselves to our fellow uh, localities. One way to look at tax burden is, is expenditures, per, per capita expenditures to per capita income. We do well. And the last thing I want to mention, and Greg kind of talked on this as well, is the economy is changing. We're, we've moved to a more techno te technology-driven economy. So uh, the telecommunications tax was implemented by the state in 2007. And part of the goal was to have a way of doing a tax neutral kind of impact. All the localities had different rates for cell phones and landlines. So they kind of lumped them all together. The state took it over, but promised neutrality. But over time, we're losing about a million dollars a year on that revenue stream. The Marketplace Fairness Act, if you're a retailer and you don't have a physical presence in the, in the state, you don't have to um, collect the sales tax. That's still going through Congress. So if uh, you, you buy something from a retailer that's not in our state, you're supposed to remit the sales tax. You get that on your um, um, state income tax. Sales tax, Greg talked on this. We are going to a more services type economy versus sales. So, but our real retail, sack, uh, retail tax is based on sales. So uh, you know, there's not as much growth there. There's been a lot of studies that have looked at that, trying to look and see if there's a tax neutral way of doing uh, that change. And then the very issues council has been discussed in Airbnb. E-cigarettes, for example, are not part of the um, cigarette tax calculation. So just quickly, I just want to go through revenue over five years, real estate. Uh, talking with Jerry, we think it's going to grow just under 3% over the next five years, 2.8% a year. And that's 50% of our revenue stream in the general fund, so it's very important. Personal property tax uh, growing, we think about 2% for the purposes of this forecast. You know, the hard thing about this, council will adopt the budget for fiscal year 19 in, in May, and we won't even have the majority of the collections in June. So we're two years behind when we do that. The consumer-driven revenues, um, these are kind of leading indicators. We found when that recession started a few months before it was declared nationally, we were seeing drops in these revenues. Sales, we think about 3% a year. b poll about 2%. Restaurant tax, uh, we have growing at about 4%. About 60% of that ends up in the general fund. Hotel tax, we think growing about 3.5% and uh, about 25% of that ends up in the general fund. State revenue, we've got a new administration. We're assuming 2% a year. There'll be another administration before this four, five-year forecast is over with. So some expenditure assumptions, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 2% salary increases, we're just assuming that. That's obviously something that council and the school board will have to discuss in the budget process. One of the big assumptions is health care. Um, we're only so showing 3%. We've been really doing well with that in our city over the last couple years. So there's been a lot of initiatives to try to uh, bend that curve downward with our wellness initiatives and some other things. So that's going to be a big part of how well this forecast comes out. So just getting into the forecast, um, this is our projection for the general fund over the next five years. Actually, this is a very optimistic forecast. Uh, you might say, well, gosh, you're showing a negative. But for example, um, when we were at the peak of the recession, we were showing a $36 million deficit in year one. And we were showing an $84 million deficit in year five. 
So we think the general fund will basically be balanced. We were able to set targets for departments at about 100% working with the city manager. And we show this growing to a $10 million deficit. But there's a lot of assumptions in there. You know, if healthcare doesn't do as well, this will get a little worse. If revenue does, be does better than we're projecting, it'll get better. So before I turn it over to Farrell, we did put in the appendix a summary of the enterprise funds. Stormwater Council adopted a five-year rate increase. We think that's in pretty good shape and we'll implement the program that Council adopted, the $300 million plus program. Shows a slight deficit in the final year, but that's plenty of time for us to sort through that issue. Water and sewer fund, we think is also uh, looking good. Slight deficits in the last, the fourth and fifth year. And the waste management fund, it is showing deficits in, in every year of the forecast. So that's something we're going to spend a lot of time in during this uh, uh, budget process. So with that, Mayor, I'm going to turn it over to Farrell. Thank you, Mayor. Farrell, we're glad to have you. <laughs> You're right. Thank you, Mayor. Good, good afternoon. Uh, this forecast reflects increases in, in state and local revenues over the forecast period. Uh, the state from anywhere from 2.5%, two, two in the outer years 3%. The local uh, increases based on the revenue sharing formula projections uh, hovers around 2% for each, each of those years. Uh, I would point out that under the revenue sources, uh, other revenue sources, uh, I want to point out that the reversion funds, uh, which is the non-reoccurring source of revenue, uh, we've been using that to balance the budget the last five years, I believe it is. So our goal in projecting in, in the five-year forecast is we want to reduce that at least by $2 million a year until we take it down to zero uh, before the forecast period ends and we're no longer having to rely on one-time revenues to balance your ongoing operating budget. This slide shows where we projected a 2% salary increase for school employees over each year of the, of the forecast period. Uh, uh, for the first time in a number of years, we're not projecting significant increases in the VRS rate. Uh, we're projecting over the five-year period for school employees and, and for uh, Virginia Beach City, uh, employ, uh, the employer rates, that they'll be steady. I know the, st the, the city's uh, numbers are a little bit different than that because it's a different uh, format for the VRS for the city. Um, Health care, as David m mentioned, uh, we're projecting that to be uh, a 3 percent raise each year. Um, those funds uh, are reflective uh, and our history over the last two years, as David indicated, been really good. It's been well below the national average. And we have made some plan changes over the last couple of years, and, and we're beginning to see that in addition to what we've done with the wellness program. Um, since salaries and benefits uh, reflect about 85% of the school's budget, um, Increases in salaries and cost for benefits is a major significant increase for schools uh, any year that that happens. Uh, lastly, we have project, projected a 2% increase for inflation for those uh, selected non-personnel uh, and salary line items. Here you see examples of our budget goals and some challenges that we face, and each of these have uh, significant resource requirements. Uh, regarding uh, specifically the last item, uh, state and federal mandates, uh, we did a, a recent estimate of the cost of state and federal mandates. This is just for the schools. And the total is $44 million. Uh, and that uh, amount doesn't in include estimates for the new federal mandate, which is the uh, financial transparency provision of every student success act. So we don't know what that's going to be, but we know it's going to have a fairly significant uh, financial impact. Continuing from the last side, slide, uh, these are some of our budget challenges. Um, 
the, the state uh, since uh, 2009 10 uh, has actually decreased funding to K through 12 education across the state. And that equates to today around uh, $575 to $600 per pupil. Uh, we're saying with that kind of a statistic that the state needs to pony up and begin to fund K-12 education in a much more robust effort than, than they've made lately. Uh, the funding life cycle uh, needs, that's an expensive proposition, but it's necessary and, and needed. Um, we can't have 25-year-old school buses out there uh, on the road, uh, number one, probably because of safety issues, but inefficiency. Uh, at, at that point in time, we wouldn't be able to get parts. Um, and I've already mentioned the, the structural flaw of our operating budget is using one-time monies of reversion funds to balance our budget. So we want to eliminate uh, that funding source as a, as a way to balance our budget. This slide pro provides a more detailed uh, look at the financial force cash revenues and expenditures for the schools. Uh, it, it's much more detailed, I won't go into that, but it, it's a part of, of your uh, presentation handout. This chart shows uh, sp sp graphically the projected uh, <coughs> deficits each year of the forecast period for the schools. I will point out that the significant increase in uh, from 20, uh, um, Let's see, it's from 2018-19 to 2019-20 is because the cost of debt service to schools jumps fairly dramatically in that one year. <clears throat> this table shows the combined expenditures and revenues for uh, both the uh, city and schools. And when combined, the total deficits uh, increase from three point, almost eight million dollars in 2018-19 to a little over $15 million at the end of the forecast period. This projected deficits are much smaller when you compare them to past years, mainly due to the improve, improving in, in economy. Uh, last year's forecast had a projected deficit of $33 million by the last year of the forecast, while this year's projected deficit is, is a little over $15 million. And, and David already mentioned this. Please note that the summary of the city's three major enterprise funds can be found in, in the appendix. Just cover a few closing thoughts and we'll bring this to an end. Uh, moving toward a sustainable forecast, this forecast does not project the higher deficits as we've seen in the past. During the recession, the combined deficits for the city and the schools were well over $100 million. Since that time, both the city and schools have trimmed or eliminated programs and positions. In addition, revenues were increased uh, for specific priorities like 30 cents uh, personal property revenue dedicated to public safety. While the forecast is not sustainable based on current assumptions over the five-year horizon, the impact on some of the key uh, drivers of the budget discussed in this forecast could reduce and or increase future deficits. Monitoring the underlying assumptions over the forecast period will help determine the, the sustainability of the current budget. The state budget, with the state beginning its own budget process this, this fall, governor rolls out his, his uh, next year's budget, the middle part of December, uh, the city and schools will need to monitor what impact the new biennial budget from the state will have on our locality. Several areas of our budget are particularly vulnerable to the changes in the state budget. The school's operating budget is heavily reliant on the uh, state funding, which also impacts the city and schools revenue sharing formula via the SOQ matches. The constitutional officers, particularly the sheriff, receive substantial portions of their budget via state allocations for partial reimbursement of salaries and fringe benefits. The sheriff also receives per diem amounts for inmate care and have been threatened in the past when the state funding is constrained at the end of the year. 
The Department of Human, Re Human Resources, City Human Resources, receives a substantial portion of its budget from the state. The city receives revenue from VDOT for maintenance of roads. The funding is critical to maintaining an efficient and safe transportation network. Uh, 599 funding, which um, is the funding the city receives for having uh, enforcement function, has been reduced dramatically over time. And tele as David mentioned, the telecommunications tax is not reflecting the current uses of telecommunication. The regional economy, and we don't differ with Greg, uh, uh, we just didn't build in the issue of the payroll taxes. We, we believe that the Hampton Roads uh, Planning District Commission summary included in this report that the national econo regional economy is growing. This conclusion is also noted in a 2017 Old Dominion University State of the Region report. The outlook for increased uh, regional economic growth has improved. Each of the major building blocks of our regional economy, defense, port, Tourism has gained momentum and our housing market continues to show a slow but steady improvement. Is there a recession on the horizon? Uh, unfortunately, recessions happen uh, on a somewhat frequent basis. The financial impact on families and businesses and government can be ranged from mild to significantly severe, especially since the country has just come out of what has been described as a great recession. It, it, it has been over eight years since that recession occurred. History would indicate that a recession would be most likely happen during this five-year forecast period. Uh, new programs and or projects. If the school board and the city council initiates new programs or major CIP projects not currently identified in, in the council and capital improvement plan, Additional fees or revenue increases should be considered or current services projects should be reprioritized. Without revenue increases and or service projects being reprioritized, uh, deficits noted in the out years will uh, increase. Uh, tax restructuring. As technological and consumer spending changes, uh, localities uh, the General Assembly needs to work together to determine a fair and equitable tax structure. This current tax system is becoming antiquated and not reflective of the growing service economy, e-commerce expansion, and emerging of 21st century economy. The goal would be to ensure uh, that businesses are treated, treated similarly for products and services that they deliver citizens would benefit from consistent tax application. In addition, some of the proposals have shown the possibility of an additional jobs being created depending on the tax restructuring involved. And with that, Mr. Mayor and the council and school board, that's the end of our presentation. Well, your timing was perfect. Questions? Council, as you know, we both had meetings at four o'clock. If there are questions, if you, uh, the city would submit them to the city manager and the super, on the school board to the superintendent and let's share those questions and answers if that's at all possible. But I think, yes, yes sir. I, I went ahead and wrote my own assessment of this report knowing we never allowed time to talk here. So I will be giving copies for us and for the school board members my personal five-year assessment. Thank you very much. All right, thank you all. Enjoy being with you all. Have a great rest of the day. And a nice Thanksgiving. Thank